9.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Hugh Lin on News 5 tonight. It may soon be compulsory for new buildings here to have more than just a barrier-free environment. The entrance to the toilet should be accessible and even the location of the toilet is important. In a bid to showcase its democratic credentials, Myanmar promises free, fair and transparent by-elections. Japanese media say North Korea has begun fueling its long-range rocket. And you can now see for yourself online which areas in Singapore are affected by floods. New buildings in Singapore will soon be required to go beyond creating a barrier-free environment and be fitted with universal design features. The Building and Construction Authority says the rules are aimed at making buildings more accessible and user-friendly for visitors of all ages and needs. It started with ramps and barrier-free walkways for wheelchair users and the less mobile. Now, the Building and Construction Authority wants buildings to cater to the needs of all possible users. It's currently reviewing the accessibility code for new buildings and those undergoing major renovation works to make it mandatory to include universal design features. This could include providing nursing rooms, family car park lots and wider corridors. Many buildings now come equipped with handicapped toilets. Such toilets are retrofitted with grab bars and have enough space for a wheelchair. But it's not just what's inside that counts. Good design means the entrance to the toilet should be accessible and even the location of the toilet is important. Those are the next challenges for Singapore, not just simply to remove physical barriers, but to say that there are other factors that affect people's lives. Uh, for example, if you have to get assistance wherever you go, well, it might be, it might be accessible, but it, it removes sometimes the dignity or the independence. Accessibility in buildings has improved over the years. Almost all public buildings now have an accessible entrance, easy to navigate first floor, and handicapped toilet on the first floor. But many existing private buildings remain a challenge for the less mobile. Private building owners cite high costs and disruption as key obstacles. We are um, talking to the industry, talking to the building owners that while these are real concern, cause and impact on operation, but we need also to look at a longer term, uh, from a longer term perspective, that if you make a building more accessible, it can also widen your catch of customers. To date, just $6 million has been dispersed from the $40 million accessibility fund, set up to help private building owners defray part of the cost. The fund has now been extended till 2016 to encourage more private building owners to come on board. The Myanmar government has promised that this Sunday's by-election will be free, fair and transparent. It says international media and observers will be allowed to move freely around the country to witness the polls. Still, observers remain cautiously optimistic, concerned that local election officials may not be ready for closer international scrutiny. Channel News Asia's Sujadi Siswo reports from Yangon. It's a scene never seen before in Myanmar. Hundreds of observers and journalists converge in a country once uncomfortable with international scrutiny. They are here at the foreign ministry to attend a briefing on Sunday's by-elections and at the same time get assurances that they will not be impeded from their duties as in the 2010 election. The Myanmar government did not disappoint, reiterating that this by-election will be free, fair and transparent. It also dismissed suggestions that international pressure had brought about this change. I think there is no pressure on the government to uh, invite this kind of uh, uh, observers because this is our decision of the government uh, to allow observers to observe by themselves that the by-election will, will be held in a very transparent and free and fair manner. Close to 200 international observers are currently in Myanmar, including those from ASEAN countries. They welcome the positive signal given by the central government, but many fear that officials at polling centres might not be ready for more transparency. We are looking forward to uh, this opportunity to uh, attend and uh, to, to see uh, the conduct of the election. And um, we um, 
on, on the day, I think it will just be uh, important for us to be able to, to witness and to, uh, to hear about the, uh, the interests of the people and the parties at each of the polling stations we're able to visit. For 25-year-old Kay Munche, it will be her first experience covering the country's election. Having voted for the first time last year, Kay says there's now less control over the media on the election coverage. I can report everything and I can now um, make your interview uh, freely. There are more than 8,000 polling centres across Myanmar and the government promises that international media and observers will be free to choose which they want to visit. Today's briefing by the Myanmar government has set the tone for the country's historic by-election, which they promised to be free, fair and transparent. Certainly we have to wait until this Sunday on polling day how these promises will eventually turn out. But as of now, the whole process looks promising. So this is for Channel News Asia in Yangon. North Korea has reportedly begun fueling its long-range rocket in preparation for a launch next month. Citing a source close to Pyongyang, the Tokyo Shimbun puts the launch date at either April 12th or 13th. According to earlier reports, the North has already moved the rocket to a launch pad in Tongchang-ri, a northwest part of the country. The US and its allies see the launch as a cover for testing long-range missile technology. But Pyongyang, which says it has invited space experts and foreign media to observe the operation, insists it's merely sending a weather satellite into orbit. Kwangmyongsong Samonun, Chigu Kwanchugi Songroso, Udinaraye Salimjaun Punpo Songyongwa, Chayunjehe Chongdo, Algog Yesang Suakotungul Panjonghago, Kisang Yeboa, Chawon Tamsadung Epidian Chariadur, Sujipage Dindago Maria Sunida. But North Korea is now paying the price for snubbing Washington's calls to cancel the launch. The United States has suspended plans to send food aid to the impoverished country. According to the deal that was reached last month, North Korea agreed to a partial nuclear freeze and a moratorium on missile testing in return for U.S. food aid. But Washington now says Pyongyang has broken its promise to halt missile launches and cannot be trusted to give help to those in North Korea who need it. India's Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has condemned a lack of political movement on reforming global institutions such as the UN Security Council and the IMF. This as leaders of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, the so-called BRICS group of emerging world powerhouses meet in New Delhi. Excellencies, we have drawn up an ambitious access plan, an action plan that will be adopted today along with the BRICS Delhi Declaration. I hope that we will be able to collaborate and cooperate with each other to shape global developments and bring tangible benefits to our people. The group has also agreed to examine the option of setting up a BRICS-led development, development bank. The initiative would allow countries to pool resources for infrastructure improvements. It could also be used as a potential counterweight to other multilateral lenders like the World Bank. Russian President Dmitry Medvedev also called on BRICS nations to increase transactions in local currencies. He said the global financial system did not yet reflect the new role that BRICS and other developing states are playing. Officials say the initiatives will take time as they need to sort out details. But they herald a new level of ambition for a bloc that brings together about half the world's population. There was a jumbo surprise for shoppers at a mall in County Cork in Ireland. They found a two-and-a-half-ton elephant running about in the car park. The 40-year-old Asian elephant called Baby had escaped from a nearby circus. Circus staff scrambled to bring Baby under control. They did so without incident and the escapee elephant is now back at the circus preparing for its next performance. Baby's handler claims no one was in danger during the incident. He says the elephant ran away to avoid taking a bath. Coming up on News 5, Earth Hour takes place on Saturday, but some companies will be sustaining their eco-friendly efforts for a lot longer than that. Young people are more creative and that's why they tend to have think of better inventions. And it's also why the government is offering young science students scholarships that carry no bond.
of News 5 tonight. From today, you can find out which areas in Singapore are affected by floods by checking closed-circuit television or CCTV images via National Water Agency PUB's website. These are at 24 locations island-wide. They include flood-prone areas like Orchard Road, Shenton Way and Bukit Timah Road. The still images are updated every five minutes with CCTVs located at roads with higher traffic flow. PUB says this will help improve public preparedness as part of Singapore's overall flood management effort. The SMRT internal investigation team tasked to look into the major train disruptions last December has received a total of 92 emails containing feedback from the public. Team leader Ong Yi Kang said feedback has been helpful in firming up recommendations in the team's report. Mr Ong said the 242-page report took about 10 weeks to piece together and was submitted to the Committee of Inquiry yesterday. It could eventually be made public after proceedings are completed. Public hearings will begin on the 16th of April. You keep drilling until you get a satisfactory answer to say this is the underlying cause. Mm. And then from there you recommend what is the actions to be taken so that you prevent a recurrence for the future. More than 300 corporate organizations will be taking part in Earth Hour this Saturday. And also some companies are going beyond the hour in their sustainability drive this year. And they're doing more than just turning off the lights. Lights out in downtown Singapore on a Saturday night, just for the environment. Shopping malls, cinemas, hotels and even restaurants are prepared to hit the light switch for Earth Hour. It's happening between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. on 31st March. But for local telco Starhub, it's only the start of a new recycling program for old mobile phones, laptops, batteries and other electronic waste. Today we're all familiar with where to recycle paper, where to recycle plastic and glass. But when you talk about electronic waste, people may ask, where can I do that? So Starhub is an Infocom's company. We feel that there's a need, uh, there's a gap there. And we can step in as Infocom's company to fill that gap and to provide um, avenues for customers to, to recycle their e-waste. Bins like this one will soon be available at Starhub service centres in the city. Starhub says about 50 million mobile phones are replaced every month around the world, but only 10% of them get recycled. And electronic waste accounts for over 70% of the toxic waste in landfills. So recycling cuts down on both pollution and waste. Also on the waste reduction trail is supermarket chain Carrefour Singapore. It will not be giving out any plastic bags for three evenings in the run-up to Earth R. I totally support it. Hmm? So you will bring your own bags? Yeah, surely. Why not? Anything for a good cause. Yes, or actually I think also what you can do is make people pay for it. You know, I don't know, like five cents or something. Sometimes if you see those auntie uncles, why they need so many plastic bags at home? And, and then I even see a lot of people after uh, accumulate a lot of plastic bags and then they throw in the dustbin. Bringing your own bags is not an issue, but the sudden sort of... Uh, Announcement like that uh, and caught many sup shoppers by surprise. I don't think they are happy. Uh. Not everyone is enthusiastic, but it looks like Earth Hour is giving Singapore companies another reason to work their businesses for the environment. $31,000 in scholarships have been given to 31 good science students in Singapore. The scholarships are worth $1,000 each and carry no bond. They were awarded during the recent Young Defence Scientists Programme Congress, showcasing the works of youths which may one day be applied to defend the country. <laughs> It's a slam dunk for this robot, which can potentially be used to drop bombs in enemy territory without risking human life. Students are learning the ins and outs of creating their own inventions to safeguard the country through Singapore's Young Defence Scientists program. The program also gave youth a chance to dabble in the field of aeronautical engineering. Well, this is the result. And bear in mind, this was almost built from scratch. Time to fly. Young people are more creative and that's why they tend to have think of better inventions, uh, think more think out of the box and that's why and of course you need to attract them to these places so that they'll be spurred on to invest in these defense related areas and contribute greatly. Our engineers and scientists are now at the forefront of what we do as an organization. 
because you can buy the equipment others can buy it too but it's that integration system of systems that last mile secret edge that allows the breakthrough to maximize to optimize and to redefine how we can protect our nation and its people so should these young researchers become future scientists, they would be the greatest resource in sharpening the country's defence technology edge. And still to come on 5, I'll have the latest on how the Singapore men's team is doing at the World Table Tennis Championships in Germany. And it may be human waste, but the urine of young boys is considered an essential cooking ingredient in one Chinese city. In business news, POSB is injecting new life into its banking services. It wants to raise productivity, profitability and service for its 3.9 million customers here. The new initiatives include allowing branch managers to operate like entrepreneurs. POSB is also looking to engage higher value customers. These are customers that hold at least $50,000 in assets and savings with the bank. U.S. global telecommunications company Qualcomm plans to establish a research and development center for new integrated circuits in Singapore. This will be its first R&D center in Singapore. It will research and design chipset in mobile devices to ensure energy-saving power management. And here are the market numbers. And in sport, an update from the World Table Tennis Championships in Germany. The Singapore men's team is in the middle of an exciting game against Belarus in the round of 16. So let's turn to our reporter in Dortmund, Jeffrey Lipp, for more. Jeffrey, how has the match been going so far? Well, we're in uh, counting. Singapore number one counting is currently at the table, uh, playing against uh, Belarus number one, Vladimir Samsonov, and he's leading 3-1. But earlier, uh, Yang Tzu beat Pavel Platonov 3-1 to give Singapore a 2-1 lead in this tie. Uh, but it's been a very unusual lineup that uh, Yang Chuanning uh, has picked for Singapore. Uh, he started with teenager Peng Xuejie against world number 13, Vladimir Samsonov. Now, I met Peng an hour before the tie started, and he looked very nervous. And uh, the weight of this match was telling in his demeanor. Ultimately, Samsonov was too great a step up in class for Pang, and he gamely lost the first match 3-0. But Kaunin came on next and worryingly lost the first game 11-5 to Evgeny uh, Chetinin. But Singapore's number one fought back in a match that swung both ways, and Kao prevailed to win 3-2 and leveled that tie at the time. Back to you, William. Okay, thanks very much for that update. Jeffrey Lip there with that update from Dortmund, Germany. Now, over the past month, schools and organizations in the Southeast District have been skipping for a good cause, and their record three million skips have managed to raise $60,000 worth of hampers for needy seniors. The finale to the community project called CP Skips for Good Food was held at St. Hilda's Community Services. About 100 preschoolers and secondary school students showed off their skills to some 100 senior citizens who later received CP food hampers. Some 2,000 needy seniors are expected to benefit from the project. Now, some people like their eggs boiled, poached or scrambled. But in eastern China's Dongyang City, spring heralds a time for indulging in urine-soaked hard-boiled eggs. Every early spring, a foul odour fills the air of Dongyang in Zhejiang province. The people call it the smell of spring. But actually, this is the smell of urine. Egg vendors go to local elementary schools to collect urine from boys preferably under the age of 10. It's not called virgin boy eggs for nothing. They begin by soaking and then heating the eggs in a pot of urine. After it boils, get all the eggs out and crack their shells before putting them back. After a while, pour in new urine. Repeat it and simmer eggs for an entire day. The eggs are supposed to taste fresh and salty.
One egg vendor says the centuries-old tradition is meant to welcome spring and promote good health. Due to its popularity, the local government has listed this unique delicacy as an intangible cultural heritage for Dongyang. But not everyone's a fan. The eggs have received mixed reviews by Chinese medical experts, with some warning about the sanitary issues surrounding the use of urine to cook the eggs. And that's News 5 tonight. Good night.